Hello, thank you for tuning in to Escar Sport and Peace Media Center. I'm your host, Soma Zabuali, and today we're featuring Dr. Dean Ravitsa. Dr. Ravitsa is an associate professor and physical education program director in the health in the Department of Health and Sports Sciences and senior research practitioner in the Bosserman um, Center for Conflict Resolution at Salisbury University. Dr. Ravitsa has served as the principal investigator of a long-term research project that's based in northern Uganda and that focuses on the role of sport in the reintegration and social inclusion of children and youth who have formerly been associated with armed groups. Uh, he has collaborated with uh, various entities on similar projects. These entities include UNICEF and UNHCR. Um, he's also been featured by uh, several media outlets such as NPR, CNN International, and the Heifer International's Wor World Arc magazine. So Dr. Dean Ravitsa, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Um, so we'll start off with uh, asking you, how did you get involved in sports? Just from a personal aspect, what attracted you to sports? Was it a particular sport? Um, I think I took pretty much the traditional route of uh, many individuals when participating in sport. Um, um, when in the U.S. Um, participating along the same lines as many others in, in youth leagues and, and at schools. Um, uh, participated in soccer and basketball mostly um, and uh, taking that traditional route on through college and participation as well um, when living abroad uh, sport is a very uniting factor for individuals and it's often a way in for individuals socially so um, was able to again be able to participate in sport along that lines as well Wait, was there any particular sport that you were drawn to um, I think, uh, uh, I interesting enough, and I'm going to share this with you, in, in, and um, we talk sometimes about um, uh, uh, the ideas of diversity and sometimes yes. even uh, racism in sport and things, um, but in, when we lived in East Africa, in Tanzania, um, I chose to play football, or what we call soccer here in the U.S. Yes. Well, like many other countries, um, football was for the blacks. And um, the whites played rugby and cricket and, sure. and, and other sports as well. And I loved football. It, it, it drew me to it. I liked, uh, um, uh, you know, just the whole physical activity aspect of it. I liked the game. I liked and uh, enjoyed the game very much. But with it came some, you know, social difficulties as well. Sure. And individuals sometimes, you, you felt almost, almost marginalized at times with that. And I've never really forgotten that. And um, mm -hmm. I think that is always um, one aspect of uh, what drives me and what I do today. Good. So, so that's a great lead-in into what I was um, wondering about next is what led you to making, dedicating yourself to the profession of sport and peace or sport for development. Um, it sounds like this might have sparked that interest. Um, it seems like it left an impact on you. And so could you speak a little bit about you know, your progression into this field, um, whether academia or practice? Sure. Actually, it's both. Yeah. Um, okay. uh, and, and what led me into it was um, a large-scale incident um, where we tried to put this into practice. Um, I lived in Tanzania for many years and uh, had the ability to go back there to be able to return there for some work right after I graduated from George Mason University. And yes, go Patriots. And um, I was back there uh, working on education projects in, in, in Tanzania. And um, all of a sudden, in, of course, in 1994, um, we all knew that the Rwanda genocide was, uh, was going on. And uh, it was very difficult within the region because a lot of information wasn't filtering through. Mm -hmm. And um, we used to play, uh, we used to play badmintons on, on Monday evenings in this hall. And one of the individuals who played with us was uh, a, d a country director for UNICEF at the time. And um, I remember, you know, we were discussing about this, you know, um, this emergency that was uh, emerging uh, from the from the West. And, um, of course, many of us were asking, you know, well, what can we do to assist with this? Um, uh, there was really an, a, a fog over it. Um, many, e even over here in the U.S. or in other developed countries, so to speak, they didn't really know what was going on. The information wasn't filtering, let alone to the neighbors. 
So um, I still remember the director saying, you know, well, Dean, you know, sometimes when you want to uh, volunteer or do things, you want to do what you do best. Well, as a re recent college graduate, I think uh, what I did best at the time was probably sleeping and eating. <laughs> but, um, but there was always sport. And so yeah. we had gathered up sport equipment. Um, we, uh, and we, there was uh, some other individuals as well that wanted to assist. We headed up in, uh, in, with, UNI with UNICEF team as well, and we had a proposal set in place and that we wanted to create some type of um, uh, sporting activities and stuff for the children and youth that were coming, uh, that were coming across the borders as refugee, immediate refugees. Mm -hmm. And um, so we went and, and just the enormity of it was, w w was just um, uh, something that cemented in my mind. Uh, the, the individuals that were coming in droves. And well, what we did was we actually found areas within, within these refugee camp area, uh, the refugee camps for children to be able to participate into the sport. But what we also found out out of this was that uh, there's many individuals, not just the children and youth, that were wanted to participate also, and not just at, in, in the actual playing of the sport, but also in the management of the sport aspect as well. And um, I, I'd like to think that um, at times, some of us, did, um, that, that it really was a springboard into this whole idea of child-friendly spaces, um, uh, the, the, these common spaces for individuals that are safe to be able to come within these type of situations to be able to not just participate in sport but also maybe alongside other um, uh, as part of holistic programming if you will maybe some emergency education um, uh, uh, the ability to address some maybe critical health needs at the time yes. could be done in this central area and sport could certainly be part of it did it work? Um, we think it for what it was at that time, yeah, we, we thought it had maybe some type of impact there. Um, uh, do we have empirical evidence to prove that? Absolutely not. Um, you know, we didn't have a background for this at the time, and there really wasn't any any template, so to speak, um, or any precedent to really go off of in, in this was, case. At the time, it was a way you just, you wanted to help. Exactly. And, and it really was a springboard into my current work, I think. Okay, C can you speak a little bit about uh, some of the, the your maybe publications, some of the research you've gone? I know um, you've done a lot of work on no in northern Uganda, sure. and I'm sure that at, at the time you did that, you were at a different stage of your life, and so yeah. it was it was maybe a little bit more than just wanting to exactly. to help. Exactly, right? you had more system behind it. Um, yeah. I'd love to hear more about that. Sure, um, that that's exactly it. Um, I, I think that there was more of a developed focus at that time. Yeah. Um, uh, there was certainly more uh, uh, precedent to go off of as well. Um, uh, I had just uh, completed my uh, doctorate in, at Virginia Tech and spent uh, a postdoc year back in, um, uh, in Uganda. Um, it was a partnership with, uh, at the time, uh, was when they issued, UN in, uh, the United Nations issued their proclamation of 2005 as the year of sport and physical education yes. for all children. So with that came really a, uh, you know, the floodgates open for the opportunity to utilize sport for development and peace building and social inclusion or addressing uh, socially marginalized groups as well. That, those type of, par that paradigm, if you will. So, right place, right time. So, yeah, actually, yeah, absolutely. So, I worked with UNICEF in their partner programs at the time, and I was doing uh, um, some data collection as well with them. And uh, one of the, um, you know, there were some large scale NGOs that were partnering with. Um, uh, with UNICEF at the time to uh, provide programming, but I was based in, in, in the capital city in Kampala. And at the time that we knew that there, there was this conflict going on in the north, and at that time it was very public, um, at least within the country and within the region. Um, uh, the, the nature of it was not always really public outside again of, uh, of that immediate region. But um, we knew that we had to do something as yes. well. And um, I had pressed on with that. And um, I was very pleased with the fact that uh, the reaction was, OK, let's try something in the southernmost part of northern Uganda where the conflict had hit, but maybe not as seriously. And we'll try and pilot some things there. Mm -hmm. And um, with that came an invitation to, so that was with um, UNICEF and it partnered with one of the large NGOs to facilitate some of the programming um, 
uh, uh, along with uh, some of the uh, community-based programs that had emerged in and around the IDP or the internally displaced person camps in that lower um, northern Ugandan region. We, uh, but with that came an invitation to me to come to uh, GUSCO, the Gulu Save the Children organization, which was an interim care center for formerly abducted children and those children formerly associated with the LRA, the okay. Lord's Resistance Army at the time. And they asked me if we could somehow incorporate sport into their holistic programming to address the immediate needs of those returnees. And that was that was quite a challenge because um, how interesting that you had done something similar like that yes be before yes it it's almost like full circle yes and um, and so I was there at the center I used to stay at the center um, uh, they introduced me there at the center and and I was very uh, I didn't thrust myself upon anyone there I just really kind of stayed back and played more of an observational role at the time. Mm -hmm. And, and that was very critical. Um, I think often we try to tend to lunge forward, if you will, too fast, and, and, and that can be very off-putting to individuals. And we have to think also here that the, the children endured you know, multiple layers of traumas uh, yes. being associated with the Lord's Resistance Army from a, as many as perpetrators of violence upon individual, other individuals, often family members, but then also um, individuals who you know, resolve their conflicts um, uh, with physical violence and often, you know, maybe with um, weapons as well. Did you feel that that observational space for you gave you a different insight and made you maybe a little bit more familiar with the complexities that you would deal with if you were to be directly involved with the children outside of the observational sphere? Absolutely. Okay. Um, that time spent at the center um, which was months and okay. um, several months at the center and working cooperatively with them really allowed us to see um, you know the role of sport a a a as an immediate response as part of holistic programming then again which is very important and mm -hmm. I'll speak to that in a little bit later but yes. um, uh, you know the children uh, you know they enjoyed sport they, they liked it a lot but we also have to be very careful because um, again sport can breed conflict as much as it can help to resolve it. And, in and thus the, it's been coined as the double-edged sword, as some yes. might say, yes. Absolutely. So um, with this, we um, this was the only time that the children really were outside of the center. We had a big playing space just at the back of the Gusco Center, mm -hmm. and um, but it adjoined um, one of the uh, large secondary schools. So, um, and um, the very first evening that we were engaging in some of the physical activity, uh, the boy often really along gender lines, girls participated in the netball, which is a traditional female sport. Okay. And um, uh, boys were wanting to play football. And the other, and then at times there was some opportunity for volleyball as well in a, in a co-ed sense. Okay. Um, which was very important for us to keep with the cultural norms as well. And uh, uh, a lot of the a lot of the children and youth it w would attract other children, a lot of children and youth from the local school when they mm. were coming out. And you know, I would play along. So sometimes I would think, wow, maybe they're here to see my wonderful skills. But uh, I don't think that was really the case. I think what is you know what is he doing um, uh, with these children and youth, whom all of them knew who they were. And, and from where they had come from, they had already had uh, had been identified as, you know, former abductees and that were at tension? the Gusco Center. And not so much tension, but there was one case on the very first night, a young boy from the school, um, secondary level um, student, walked through the middle of our playing area, and about midway through, I yelled to him to be very careful. Yes. And it wasn't I wasn't angry at him. I just wanted him to be aware that he was in a playing space and he might get injured. Yes. And okay. so and he turned to me and he said Mazungu, which of course is the Swahili for for referring to my skin, the 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 white man. Why do you waste your time with these rebels? Is exactly what he said in front of everybody. And this was a kid. Yeah. Interesting. And right then and there I was able to somewhat understand the cloud of stigma that embodied these returnees 
and what they were facing out in their communities. And however, mm. a couple weeks later, the same boy came back and asked me if he could play. What do you, what do you attribute that to? That um, I attribute it to the fact that we didn't really have a reaction to him, so mm. to speak. But, um, and the reaction is very important, and I'll speak to that also in just a bit. And um, I think that he saw that really these boys and girls enjoyed playing the sport just as anyone else on the other um, fields or the, the, that was adjoined to this playing area was mm. doing, that um, we were highly competitive yet well-structured, and, um, and we enjoyed ourselves. And probably also had something to do with me being there. Um, and sometimes that is the case that think, okay, you know, maybe, oh, if I'm there, what's he doing for them? Can he do the same thing for me or something mm. along that line? You never know ulterior motives also. And I never sought to ask it. But sure. however, um, uh, I left it up to the young boys and girls. It wasn't for me to uh, say, yes, you could play or not. It was their space and it was up to them. And um, after that first incident, we had begun, I went to the social workers at the center, and one of whom was out there with us and saw this incident happen. Uh -huh. And I asked them, can we talk about this? Can we discuss this incident? And from that came what we called under the mango tree, um, just our dialogue that emerged after we participated in sport, uh, whenever we had the sport component, we came up with these. Um, we, we came up with these dialogues. One of them, for instance, was um, how did that? You know, how did that make you feel hearing that? And there was a lot of dialogue that came about. That, uh, came came about from the children and youth saying that, well, you know, he doesn't know me. Um, he could have just as easily been been uh, abducted, just like we were. We didn't ask for it, and. Um, and, and he should get to know us before he makes these judgments. Mm -hmm. So it was very interesting to see their, you know, to get their point of view of it. That's very, very important because, again, you know, it's not up for me to dictate how they feel. You know, they need to be able to express it. And so over that, I said, okay, you know, and that's fine. And when that boy came back, I told the group, you know, he wants to play. You know, it's your decision. Mm -hmm. And, so, and they did have, you know, and they did say, well, you know, that's fine, you know, we welcome him to play. And I think that really, that reaction is very important, and I'll speak to a second reaction later, in terms of overcoming that, that, that stigma that is often associated with being formally associated with our groups. Uh, you speak to something very important, I think, in, well, you speak to there's multiple things, yes, but, yeah, but yeah, one yeah. thing that stands out in my mind is, is you're speaking to how sport is used. And it's important, and you spoke to the structure that was involved right. in the program. And right. you, also, um, you also highlighted that, that that structure and how it was used was almost a stepping stone toward more dialogue and dialogue right. about other important things and, and uh, tapped into the complexities of the situation. Um, so I, I, that was nice to hear. Right. Uh, we, we, we really wanted to, and I think it goes back to that whole idea if you read some of the literature on creating social spaces. Okay. And there is some of that literature that has been brought into this idea of sport and sport and peace building and conflict resolution and stuff about the idea of creating that social space. And again, I'll speak to that in just a little bit about you know what we're looking at in terms of the creation of what we call the um, uh, peaceful environment for play. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can can you um, can you tell me a little bit about some of the conclusions or some of the methodologies maybe that you've used in in your research? Oh, absolutely. Uh, maybe some of the products. Um, <laughs> sure. Yeah, conclusions slash products. Sure, absolutely. Um, first of all, um, from these experiences um, was really the springboard into some large-scale research. Um, I spent a period of nearly a year doing observational research in the region on the uses of sport. Okay. Um, who was participating? Who had access? In what were they participating? Um, why weren't 
individuals participating if if they if they didn't yes. um, was it their own choice or was it something that was dictating their choice um, we we looked at um, uh, so we, we developed, uh, after that observational period, which was very important, it allowed me to really discover what type of measures would be utilized in order to collect more data. Excellent. Originally, we were focusing in on just the research embodying the sport as the means for reintegration and social inclusion for those former abductees. Okay. Those formerly associated with the LRA. Yes. But it was at the urging of the local district governments and, and I still remember the um, uh, local uh, uh, district uh, gender officer in the Kitkum district in northern Uganda who said, Professor, you know, this is really good and we support your work very much, but all the children are war affected, so we might want to look more broadly. Whew. So even came more, more, support. more, more uh, the support was certainly there, but even more uh, responsibility. Exactly, also. greater responsibility yes. to report the, uh, you know, to, to, to try and, you know, uh, report evidence towards that, obviously that statement. Um, we chose to do some more large scale research, uh, uh, large scale survey research at the time as one of the instruments that we would utilize. And we um, surveyed nearly 500 um, children and youth ages 12 to 22 in the Gulu and Kikum districts in northern Uganda, both war affected, heavily war affected districts in, 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 in that region. So how were these children selected? Um, we did uh, we did mostly random selection. We looked okay. uh, we but we looked at uh, some important factors also. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted to have a gender balance, and my team, which is made up of all Northern Ugandans, did an excellent job. We had 51 percent males, 49 percent females, That's and such so about as gender balanced as you can get. <laughs> um, we looked for a large sample of um, formerly abducted within it. We had nearly okay. th we had approximately 35 percent. Our responses were associated with the LRA at one point in time for yes. short periods of time to periods of many years. Okay. Um, we looked at whether they were in school or maybe out of school in the community. We used the schools as a starting point to collect data. Okay. But then also, we just didn't want, obviously, that voice to be heard. We want the individuals who also were not in school to be able to participate also. And the schools were absolutely wonderful in their support of not just allowing us to survey um, children and youth within their school, but also helping us locate children in the immediate community who were not going to school to be able to survey also. And the children, um, it was, it was, participation was voluntary? Absolutely, yes. absolutely. And and individuals say, well, what, what would they get out of it? Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that we had settled upon, and when I say we, some other research going on at the time as well, and uh, we had thought that it would be best to, uh, for completion of the survey, that they could have, dare I say, a small gift was what, obviously, the term that was used, but it wasn't, you know, it's just something, a, a, a participatory gesture, I guess you okay. could say. And we had, for, for those that were in school, um, they, were, they received a, um, uh, a small uh, set of pencils, um, eraser, a notebook, and a small kit, all Essentials. of about exactly. Nice. But for those outside of school, they would look at that and say, "What would I want that for?" Yeah. So we made sure that we had a separate, uh, separate gesture also for them, and that included um, a small package of salt, um, some matchboxes, and um, oh, there was a few other things in there. I just I don't recall right off the top of my head what was in there, and and that way then they were for participating in in, in the survey as a small gesture for doing so. Um, we were able to go, like I said, and collect nearly 500 uh, clean surveys. And then from that, we decided to do a 10% panel of follow-up also uh, to be able to do some more in-depth interviews. And um, What kind of questions were asked at the interviews? Sure. Uh, we, we did some more probing questions in terms of looking at some key aspects of the uh, key aspects of the survey. We looked at, um, we looked at uh, whether or not sport uh, could help um, we, we looked at it in several different aspects. We looked at the development aspect. We, we looked more at, at first at participatory aspects. Okay. Um, and what were they participating in? Well, you know, it wasn't groundbreaking news that they were playing football, you know, the soccer equivalent, and, and netball and volleyball. But there was also participation along the lines of um, athletics as well. Mm -hmm. um, 
and uh, very, very few, um, if any, had participated in sports like basketball and even rugby and some other, uh, some other sports as well. Um, we, we looked at those participatory patterns. We looked at who was participating, where and when. We found that, um, of course, uh, schools were the largest venue in mm. which individuals were participating in sports. So we looked at it two ways. This is a great way to address any concerns through the schools, but then we also had the concerns that, well, um, a, a pretty significant number of individuals were participating in sport because they didn't go to school. So the whole idea is, how do you get them to school? And th as the main, obviously, the main aspect of that. And then they could derive the benefits of the sport um, through the participation within their school. We found that, obviously, that they lack community-based programs, which was a, a key finding in, in that, um, in that um, sport control data, if you will. Okay. We looked at um, the development aspect, and we found that uh, a nice little caveat. We found a very reliable subscale we called the economic development subscale, okay. which um, uh, the children and youth felt that um, sport could help with um, develop what we called um, some of the uh, workplace values, and so that helped them with leadership, helped them with um, uh, uh, resolution to conflict and, mm. and things like that. Um, but However, they didn't feel that sport really could help with their employability in that aspect, that it really wasn't there for them, oh, I really can't get a job with sport. And so, so that was an interesting piece also that came out of that. Um, we looked at the, the sport and conflict piece was very important. And uh, from that, we derived inductively a lot of the work which we're doing now. Uh, was the springboard into into the work we're doing now? We looked at we identified four levels of conflict okay. that occurred during sport, and from low level disagreements and arguments to higher level physicality and even what we called the harmful level of sport, where um, individuals were maybe marking other individuals to do harm to them who may have done something to them or their family outside of the sport setting. Uh, for instance, you, you killed my sister and brother and uncle in the village, um, and now you're on the opposing team, and I've noticed you, and now I'm waiting, but I'm going to do harm to you through that sport, because you did harm to me already, even outside of sport. And um, we found that to be a very, very powerful level that was significant within the communities, but wasn't really high rate of instances that happened. You can also have that level occur maybe off of some physicality that incurred during sport. For instance, if I tackled you really hard playing football or I knocked you yes. over playing netball, well, what is your response there? Sometimes the immediate response is a physical response yes. where I get up and push the individual or hit the individual. Mm -hmm. But also it may be a delayed response that, oh, I'm going to wait and I'm going to do harm for you later. That's that other level of sport, that kind of that delayed response with the intention to injure or do harm to an individual. So we found these levels of, levels of conflict in sport, we call them, and then we began to inductively understand how they went about resolving the conflict um, within the sport. And then we were able to uh, be able to extract culturally contextual ideas for resolution to conflict in sport that was occurring in that area. With the hope of also being able to transfer those values, those strategies, if you will, to other areas of maybe some low intensity conflict that was occurring and was still well noted within the region. Um, perhaps even, uh, you know, there was land disputes that were going on. And we're not claiming that, you know, we can solve all the different conflicts through, through these strategies. Yes. But there's conflict that occurs in home, school, and community, and in which the children and youth are often engaged and maybe they could take some of these strategies and transfer them to these other low intensity conflicts to be able to resolve them with our hope of maybe building a bit more peaceful community with that. How, you know, how do you envision ad addressing, you know, the types of conflict that you mentioned through sport? For example, the someone, this notion of revenge, you know, almost sure. that yeah. I'm hearing. Yeah. How would one deal with that? Because this to me, you know, talks, uh, refers to the other 
you know, end of the double-edged sword. Um, a and sharp I know one it's, a, <laughs> it's a sharp one, and and I know it's a big concern, especially when the topic comes up with utilizing sport for conflict resolution. Right, right. Well, we look at you know we look at that exactly that immediate resolution, the strategies for immediate resolution to conflict that was occurring to bring about obviously some type of resolution to these conflicts yes. that were occurring. So that way then the student, the, the children and youth could go back to playing, which is what they set out to do. Sure. And enjoying and deriving the healthy benefits of participating in sport, both from a physical level but also from a social and emotional level as well. Yes. Um, we look at that though, we, some of the strategies we, we looked at though was the, obviously the idea of seeking outside help. We found that the role of the, the, the individual facilitating the sport, be it a co community-based coach, be it a, a school-based sport teacher, or even an older youth that was facilitating the sport, really kind of helped shape that atmosphere, shape that environment if you will. Um, and be able to help address some of those conflicts. Some things are bigger than the sport, obviously. Um, some of these revenge tactics and things. Uh, we obviously we said that you know, we we want to do things where the child can continue to participate in in the sport, but maybe they have to have some type of removal from the activity until it's addressed by either that that elder, that that coach, or that outside source, if you will. Um, or maybe even another outside source within the community that would help mediate that um, uh, situation, uh, be it like a village elder or a, um, a local that, person, exactly, yes, someone that that's trust. looked up that's exactly yes. very well trusted and very well respected within the community. Why? Because that's part of the culture. Yes. Um, it's not necessarily always part of our culture. And so we have to be very careful, and that's where I want to stress that we really, the, the research was there to be able to help put in place these strategies because it came from the children and youth. Mm. Um, and, and that is really, really an important piece that we can't always impose these Western strategies on individuals because they don't fit. Sometimes they're round peg square hole. Yes. And, and we have to be very careful about that. Um, Especially in sensitive situations. Absolutely. And in very highly sensitive situations where there's, you know, complex layers of trauma that are involved. Um, levels of complexity of conflict that are bigger than all of us at times. We have to be very careful about that. So we hope that at times even that, so we have this idea of, of conflict resolution and then that whole idea of the peace building aspect of yes. uh, establishing or even reestablishing these um, positive relationships um, within individuals within the sporting atmosphere and hopefully mm -hmm. transfer them to outside of the, that, that sport venue. And then the idea of, you know, we really look at it as, you know, the idea of conflict transformation also. Yes. But, but we look at it modestly, that contributing to the overall social and political implications of conflict. And we look at it as very modestly in that point, um, that maybe that we can go and somehow provide some type of um, uh, resolution to some of the conflict that would occur outside of the sport and contribute to maybe the overall building of what we call the inclusive communities. A stepping stone. Exactly. Yes. But in no way do we look at saying that sport is going to transform the area. And yes. So from, from uh, post-conflict to, you know, all of a sudden this is some type of panacea that's going to be utilized to all of a sudden rid the area of any type of conflict because that's that's just you know that's not the scope of what we do yeah. nor is it within the scope of sport really yes no and i'm, I'm glad you mentioned yeah. that because I, I i have heard arguments about you know how law how is sport going to solve the conflict and exactly. and my thought is always well you know it's that that's not really like you said it's not really in the scope exactly. i mean it's you know how you structure it right. how you know right. how you how it's very important things you mentioned include culture in in the um, in the program and then have that be a piece of the resolution right. um, rather really than be right we really wanted it to be their program it's yes. not my program and so it's their program and it's their strategies and that's why I tell people this is what you told me I just put it into print mm. and so in, in a logical order so that way then we can share it together and that's what's really, really important to me is that it's a we. And people always ask me, 
you know, you always speak of this we, who's the we? And I said myself and, and my Northern Uganda team of, of, of research assistants. And, um, and, and just a quick clarification, sorry to sure. jump into that, but y your team also, which I'm, you know, was Northern locals, yes, they absolutely. were the ones who were also administering interviews and, and engaging with the children. Absolutely. They okay. completed every single one of the surveys out in the field. Mm. I've never done a survey, and it's not from a lack of obviously hard work, <laughs> it's the fact sure. that it's the fact that they're going out they're going, the, the respondents are going to be more open to individuals within their own culture. At times they're going to tell me what it is that they think that I want to hear. One little piece you mentioned about methodologies, and I share some of these uh, uh, very interesting. Number one, um, multiple, multiple uh, methodologies in order to triangulate data is extremely important. Mm. But you come up against also individuals when working in this field sometimes, individuals who are illiterate, um, uh, especially some of the children and youth who were in their formative years were abducted for many years mm -hmm. and came back and obviously had um, uh, uh, very low levels of education and um, often couldn't read or complete a survey or things. So we came up with some strategies. We came up with a picture strategy of um, being able to put pictures down and, and to put stones, a number of stones on the picture that's the most important to you. Um, we came up with utilized stones and sticks and you know, things like that. It had to be very, very creative in terms of, and, and that again was in collaboration with my team. Mm. We thought, okay, you know, uh, they're having trouble understanding. Okay, well, let's go back and let's figure out ways in which we can articulate what it is we want them uh, 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 to answer, but do so in a way in which would be very meaningful and also really increase that reliability. I think of the, uh, uh, of the data and stuff in which we collect that it's on their level and they're and they're speaking to their level at which they can and um, uh, and still making a strong contribution to the research. So uh, that that was really important to us. So you do have to come up with creative methods in yes. order to collect your data at time according to obviously the individuals with whom you're interacting. And you mentioned a keyword reliable, um, and, and that's important for having work like this. Yes. Initiate other further research Absolutely. along these lines, so that you know we can we can really, you know I I, I know this field is really just booming, um, and it's important that we have strong, um, solid methodologies and experiments happening. That's um, one of the things in which we really need to consider. It's both a weakness and a way forward. Mm. Um, I call it telling the story empirically. <laughs> Okay. And uh, we need to tell our stories empirically. Yeah. Uh, not just not just researchers who are going out there, but also those implementing programs. Mm. And I think that, that we can and should look at our strengths collectively mm -hmm. and to see how can we join together more to be able to tell that story. Um, there's some wonderful programs that are out there, but maybe lack the ability at times to be able to tell their story empirically, as I say, to collect that data with, with, with very rigorous methodologies mm -hmm. and to be able to go and, and then obviously analyze and then share those particular findings. We shouldn't be afraid of what we're going to find. Um, uh, and I think sometimes that's who we are. I'm the first one to say that, hey, I will stand up and tell you that sport right now was showing that, uh, it, it, through our data, showing modest ways in which um, children and youth formerly associated with armed groups can be included back into their communities. Mm -hmm. We have empirical data that says that, that, that former abductees stated that through sport, they felt that um, they were great, more, um, more accepted by their peers and community members. We have that, we have empirical data. But what we don't have is to say, um, can we say that long term? That it really, uh, what, what is the factors of, of sport, if you will, that help determine long term social inclusion? Mm -hmm. um, we have to go back into the whole idea of what is long term social inclusion. It's not for me to dictate what that is um, for former abductees because, uh, to tell them what it is because it's very personal, it's, it, it, it's very um, contextual, if mm. you will. Um, it's up for them to tell us that. And that comes through, um, again, 
through the research. Through more and, things. and more and, research. And it's very important to have a focus group discussions, one-on-one mm -hmm. -on -one discussions um, uh, with individuals. Can you do um, uh, uh, some type of um, uh, qualitative methodologies that would be there within your focus groups to be able to categorize um, uh, uh, what is important to them in terms of, uh, you know, that is also culturally contextual, in terms of them living out their lives within their communities in, in the way in which they feel is necessary to be part of their communities. It's not for me to tell them that. And so, so that's very important for them to tell us that. And then we can look to see what role does sport play in that, if it does play a role. Mm -hmm. And I'll be the first one to say, you know what, we don't have data to present to, to state that. It does assist with the long-term social inclusion, but we're working on it. And hopefully we'll get there, and we'll be able to see what factors maybe do apply in that situation. And so really your vision forward um, is, is potentially mm -hmm. Mi obviously more research, yes. um, but really a mix of qualitative and quantitative oh, sure, sure. Um, multiple measures method, going forward, multiple, multiple methods. methods. Multiple methods research and stuff, mixed methodologies uh, that would be able to, again, really tell the story well. The, um, the bigger exactly, picture of the story. Exactly. Um, we felt that the original research that we had really was, it, there's no absolutes in it. We can't say that for sure, but we do feel that we did large enough research that it represents the voices of the children and youth mm -hmm. within those age groups very well. Um, and, and we were able to springboard this now into what we call the um, peaceful play strategies for resolution to conflict in sport. Yes, yes. And good. where we derive those um, uh, through the inductive analysis, those levels of sport and the culturally contextual um, strategies for resolution. We looked at um, the idea of developing ways in which you can transfer, and 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 a lot of these resolutions were there because they were telling us this. We pa we wanted to kind of package it, if you will, mm -hmm. to raise the awareness towards it even more, and how to utilize this. So we had a pilot group of um, community-based coaches and sport teachers from northern I in the regions in northern Uganda, the conflict-affected areas in uh -huh. those districts. And um, we're very happy with uh, some of the outcomes again, and you better believe there's data collection, uh, again, yes. multiple methods. Um, we, did, um, we did surveys again, pre and post surveys, um, uh, while they were in this um, uh, pilot, uh, uh, during the time of the pilot. So that way then, uh, the, the coaches and sport teachers could tell us what was working, what wasn't working. Um, do you f feel these strategies had an influence on your program? And we were very pleased with some of the changes, if you will, in the attitudes that were um, uh, that were there previously. For instance, um, many of the coaches didn't feel that children and youth were capable of resolving their own conflict. But towards the end, uh, at the end, of the post survey that had shifted to a more positive, um, <laughs> uh, a, a more positive outlook on that. So we said, so from that, what do you gauge? Let's get children and youth involved in it even more. So we look at data-driven um, uh, data driven responses, mm. obviously, to that. And so we want to then be able to expand more with more coaches and sport teachers at the request, obviously, of the, uh, the districts in northern Uganda. But we also want to involve some of the youth. And we felt that was very important because it's often, as we know, it's often many of the, the, the adults that are creating the conflict, and sometimes it's the youth that need to resolve it <laughs> or will be there why to not? resolve it. So why not? So, um, so we're targeting at the schools. They have um, what we call sport prefects, okay. um, which are kind of the leadership roles of, uh, uh, of, uh, 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 of male and female take on in terms of assisting the sport teachers with the organization implementation of the sport at the schools. So we figured there's two individuals right there that could um, uh, be very worthy in terms of um, being able to resolve the conflict in sport because they're very visible within the sport. Mm. Um, we looked also at um, one of the things we're very excited about, I get excited about everything, but um, <laughs> uh, I'm very excited about is that we also had a coach's log where the coaches oh. were able to self-report incidents of conflict and the strategies that they utilize. Well, off that we can also take uh, from that we can also take control data, and that will allow us to show where where 
conflicts were occurring, what type of conflict, and what strategies were utilized uh, were utilized to resolve it. Mm. So then we could do a type of ma conflict mapping, as we called it, and we looked at uh, being able to have maps of the district and pinpoint where these conflicts were occurring. But then can we look over a period of time to see whether or not those conflicts were subsiding just a bit. And not only in sport, but then can we look outside of sport as well. And maybe seeing whether or not uh, this type of program has any type of impact on, again, the, the resolution to yes. conflict even outside of the sport to build, as we said, more inclusive communities. Yes. It's ambitious, but it's, it's, it's very well possible. So we're really working hard to structure methodologies around being able to support that. Good. Um, sounds, it is exciting to me. It does. <laughs> uh, so what, would you like to speak about maybe some of um, upcoming publications, um, okay. upcoming research that sure. we should look out for or possibly you know, point us toward where we can find some of your um, past research, particularly the ones on Northern Uganda? Oh, sure. Um, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm working very hard to um, create just a small website so that way then I can put all of the work that's up there. Of course, one of the links will be the outstanding um, uh, uh, efforts you put into the Sport and Peace Building <laughs> Symposium at U.S. Oh. Institute for Peace back a couple of years ago, and they do have the video um, uh, of the um, uh, of the proceedings yes. there, uh, of the proceedings up on the website, which we can link to, and I think it's very important. I send students there sometimes to take a look and nice. see, say, hey, see, Dr. R's got it going on. Sometimes <laughs> he's, 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 he's there. And, Dr. Uh, Ross, uh, he's uh, there. Dr. R. Oh, Dr. Say, R. Dr. R. Okay. Yeah. So I need to start so, calling you Dr. Ross. <laughs> no, 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 that's Dr. Okay. R. Dr. R. But, um, uh, you know, things like that are very important to see that individuals are doing work. So it's not just me, but also who else is doing some of this work to be able to get a holistic view of, uh, yes. of the work. Um, coming out soon is um, uh, the uh, book called Sport, Peace, and Development, um, edited by Keith Gilbert okay. from the uh, 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 professor of sports sociology at um, University of East London, longtime professor. And um, he will, he has edited this book and I've contributed at his request to the book. And it will give a good overview on um, uh, sport and the, the uses of sport for the reintegration and uh, social inclusion of the former Bektis in northern Uganda. Um, the, yeah. So the website, though, I'll, I'll PDF uh, several different versions of, uh, of the research and things and put it up there. And also, um, as I've stated before about the Peaceful Play program, we yes. had also produced the manual uh, yes. um, as, um, uh, with support from the Bosman Center for Conflict Resolution at Salisbury University. And um, If you uh, can supply me with... Absolutely. That and, information and I can distribute. Absolutely. Have it made available. Absolutely. It'll be made available and individuals can see kind of the framework in which we utilize. Yes. And uh, for this program, uh, we have in there also the idea of the transfer and from um, from the sport to the homeschooling community outside of sport situations because okay. it's very important. We don't want to compartmentalize everything just within sport because they're only there for a short time. Yes. Let's capitalize on what we can do with sport and through sport into other areas as well. And then um, and we have in there also, one of the last things that I'll comment on is we talked about the social spaces. Yes. And I really take it to heart. And what we looked at was what we call creating the peaceful environment for play. This idea of conflict sensitivity. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, and not just of those implementing the sport, but of some of the, part of the participants as well. We look at um, the, uh, the conflict sensitivity. It's kind of packaged along with that trauma sensitivity and also the aspects of child protection, which are very important in these situations. So we look at, um, for instance, coaches and, and sport teachers having, a, uh, um, having an idea of some of the levels of trauma that were obviously incurred as a result of the conflict and being sensitive towards it. Um, uh, cer certain language that can be utilized. Often we say, okay, boys and girls, let's go out and kill them. 
And obviously that's not in the context in which we no. have to be able to utilize. We have to be very careful about that. Yes. But conversely, the participants also, um, those that were obviously active participants or perpetrators within the conflict mm -hmm. have that stigma I talked about around them and they may be looked at as overly aggressive or, or, or a threat to the peace within the play, if you mm. will. And um, so it's very important for them to be able to express themselves also um, uh, and uh, but uh, but to do so on how they really feel, uh, using the words wisely, if you will. Um, and and for instance, uh, uh, a young boy or girl uh, may be very frustrated, but if they come up and say, "I'm angry," well, then there's that stigma again, and they may be turned off. They say, "Oh, well, you're just an angry, um, upset form of duck deed. and you're very violent and very aggressive." But if they came up and say, "You know, I'm frustrated." that can spur on conversation, yes. which can help obviously reduce, reduce those frustrations. And if that frustration is within the play, then it can help obviously with that um, in, in intergroup um, uh, uh, cohesion, if you will, and stuff as well. So those are some things that we're focusing on also now, also, which I think is very, very important yes. because we often look at the content of what we're doing and we don't look at the structure the environment, and that's what we want to highlight next. That sounds like a good way forward. Yeah, absolutely, um, that's the way forward. And I look forward to learning more about your research, um, and hopefully we can work together in the near future. Absolutely, I'm around. <laughs> that's good. Uh, you, you know where to find me, George You Mason. asked me about a funny anecdote. And, yes! And I'm going to I'm gonna tell you one thing, and, and it, 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 it's funny in terms of really imagining it happening and always the always the conflict is is very serious and not a choking matter but you can find light in some things and i found very light in this because it was a critical juncture in terms of the light bulb going on for me okay we were playing um uh, uh the football the soccer out back the four when i say we the um uh, uh those formerly associated with the lra at the interim okay. care center and uh one boy was tackled very hard and he got, um, the one boy who did the tackle got up to help him, and I thought, oh, that's great. And the other boy who was tackled pushed him down mm. immediately. And one of the social workers was there and walked over and said, you know, you know this is not appropriate behavior. And, so, and need to apologize. And the boy resisted at first and everything, but then he did, and they resumed play, which, okay, that's fine. Resolution to conflict. Did we really resolve it? At that point, we're not too sure. But so we said that's why we had the dialogue pieces at mm. the end. And uh, because off of that, would some of that harmful level come about, that revenge, if you will, the revenge tactics and stuff. But it didn't happen, which was fine. So it stayed at that level, that physical level of, uh, of conflict. Later during the dialogue, the young boy, you know, obviously voices frustrations, but he said, Professor, I didn't push him down because I was a rebel. I pushed him down because it hurt. Oh, <laughs> and I thought that was very interesting for him to, and, and I did kind of laugh. I, I said, oh, okay. And I thought that was very astute of him to be able to kind of separate himself, his current self, from that of the former rebel. But what we, And he communicated that. Exactly, and he communicated that. And that was very important. He used his words. And so that allowed us to dialogue, though, and, and about it as a group. And But what we, what we have to realize is that the cloud of stigma, again, that is around them, they're overly aggressive. They're mm -hmm. a physical threat to the well-being of the community. Mm -hmm. um, all the, that stigma that surrounds them. Well, and often they're provoked. They're provoked by community members, maybe, and stuff to see or their response. Or by those stereotypes. Or, 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 or exactly. So when they do encounter such situations, their response to those situations is critical mm -hmm. for their well-being, for their future well-being within those communities, or that long-term social inclusion. So we discuss that a lot, and and it, look what comes out of just sometimes <laughs> these situations and stuff. But I always thought it was, I, I make it's light a telling, of it also. It's a telling exactly. story, yeah. And that was very important because that's when a light bulb went off and said, mm. you know, we need to study this deeper. And so, so here, and I'm I, glad here you have. I sit. <laughs> so that's great. Well, um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if you, I'm going to actually leave the 
floor for you if there's anything you'd like to further comment on. Um, I, I think one, one, one last piece that, sure. um, that is really important is, and I think that I've highlighted a bit, but just really needs to be hammered home, if you will, <laughs> sure. um, that idea of, of the partnerships and when working with that global south, if you will, or the partnerships, um, that the individuals have a lot to contribute. And we want to work in partnership or in tandem with them. Um, if we seek to go into other communities, especially you know in post-conflict or in disaster situations, or uh, be it natural or human-made or wh whatever type of situations, that that these individuals have a lot to contribute. And that's why I always say we um, that that this is their program. This is um, uh, you know they told us this story, if you will. And, and this is how we reacted to it. Um, it's very important we've negotiated uh, to negotiate with individuals if you're working with partners at other universities or within the community to negotiate with them maybe to um, ha uh, for them to be part of publications and presentations and uh, we're going to be doing some um, presentations within the districts and down in the capital in Kampala uh, coming up in March um, back over in Uganda and each one of um, uh, 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 my, my research assistants are going to play an integral role in that in terms of talking about maybe data collection methodologies and things but also some of the coaches from the pilot program are very important to us because they're going to be able to speak to the program and the changes that evolved also. So it's really important for individuals, especially from the global north, if you will, uh, that are partnering with, the, uh, that, that seek to do work in the global south, to be able to form that strong partnership with them, and that it's a we, not an I, or, or, or it's not just for the benefit of, of the individual going in there, but it's for really keeping an eye on the benefit of all those involved. And so that's, that's one of the things I think that we have to look at moving forward um, in this field very much is that. And, and of course, like I said, telling our story empirically is very important. Yes. And sharing methodologies. I'm, I'm always open to sharing methodologies and stuff which we utilize. And maybe they can transfer within other um, cultural contexts as well and or can be modified within that context. Um, so that's important so that we come up with some common methodologies um, that produce reliable, valid data in which we can continue to build the foundation for this field. Well, I like that, and I'm definitely go. going to take note of your um, your emphases. And, yeah, um, and again, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us. Um, we'll be in touch. Please send me information that you have so I can make it available. Absolutely. Um, and we will take it from there. And I look forward to maybe... Um, a future podcast together, um, maybe once you have you know some of these stuff that you talked about, maybe once we get a little bit more progress on them, um, like your meeting in March, absolutely, uh, we and, can get and an update any more on that. Data that comes out of it, and be happy to share. Excellent. And it's always a pleasure to be back with George Mason University. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for tuning in today. We've spoken with Dr. Dean Ravitza from Salisbury University, and we've learned a little bit about his research on the reintegration and social inclusion of children and youth from uh, formerly associated with armed groups. Thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you next time.